My uh, mission tonight is, uh, it comes to an important political event happening at the university at the moment, which is a um, commission of inquiry on the history of eugenics. And I sit on that commission. I do not speak for them. Um, I speak for myself. And uh, um, the commission is exploring the history of eugenics at UCL uh, from the middle part of the 19th century to the present and asking what on earth has been going on here and how does it impact the, the life of the university. So that's the context of thinking about this. And, and I'm going to ask you for help. Um, there's a part of this that I don't know anything about. And I'm in, I'm really in uncharted waters, and that's where you're going to help me. So the presentation is going to be, um, one part is going to be me telling you something. Another part is going to be a turn where I set up the thing that I don't know anything about, and I ask for help. And then in the discussion, you can tell me all the things you know that you think are important to this particular thing. So does that make sense? Yeah. So if you guys didn't catch that on the way in, it's Joe Kane is the best histo historian of science that there is at UCL. He's fantastic, and you're really lucky to have him here tonight. So if, you know, just for the you know, and if you missed that, you can pick it up on the. In my way, I was trying to say that. Though. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. So so let me talk to you about eugenics. So who knows about eugenics? Who reckons there are medium level knowledge about eugenics? Oh, interesting. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, it's always this, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about eugenics in a really schematic way, really fast moving. So it's a it's a story of two parts. Um, eugenics takes one or one of two turns um, across the second half of the 19th and and well into the 20th century, and certainly today. The first the first part of it starts with with dogs and breeds. Eugenics is about words like breed and stock and uh, variety and trait, words like that fit into one part, one tradition in eugenics. It fits very comfortably in that tradition. And it, uh, it comes out of a much, much before whatever you think you, what genetics was, long before genetics, there's discussions about pedigrees and stocks and lineages and crossings and all that stuff in, in, in agriculture, whether it's prized animals, or, or cockerels, if you can actually see that, and, and human beings too. So, so one strand of eugenics begins in this, can we just call it an agricultural direction, where pedigree and stock and line and lineage are important. Uh, this kind of image shows up in eugenics discussions all the time. And basically, it's a crossing of, let me just be so cheap and easy on this tonight, one chicken and another chicken, um, and following from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next, and, and asking about what traits or qualities pass predictably from one generation to the next, to the next. And eugenics get excited when geneticists develop new theories of inheritance that feel like you're gaining predictability, feels like you're getting confidence about what's a trait, so what part of, a, of an organism you can put boundaries around and say it's a trait, like in this, in this case, the color of the chicken, it's not really chicken, just give me a break, but uh, uh, the color of the chicken as it's going from generation to generation to generation. And, and most importantly, the predictability or the pattern here. So one, one part of eugenics is about this bit of agriculture or biology, and you see it played out in the writings of eugenicists. So here's an example of a family tree that we're also familiar with. So it's one generation, then the next, then the next. The squares represent males, the circles represent females. And this is a genealogy or a family tree or a pedigree, um, for, to use the agricultural language, of um, trying to figure out musical ability in a family. And you can see here just from the illustrations, it's not that complicated, that sort of musical ability and super music ability. What they're trying to do is explain here how it is that all the kids in the family are really great at music. And so what you see here is a, is a genetic or hereditarian or eugenics conversation about inheritance. We see this kind of stuff pop up in eugenics all over the place. And some of the eugenics political mission is to um, add more of some things and remove more of other things, uh, is roughly, roughly put. Here's another example of family tree. Now that you're a pro at interpreting these, you can interpret this. 
and it's a family tree, one generation and the next and the next and the next and the next. This is a particularly important family tree because uh, Charles Darwin is here, hero extraordinaire. Charles Darwin is here with Emma and the kids. And what this is supposed to show is a study of male intelligence. And everything that's blackened is super intelligent. And everything that isn't, mm, you know, like 2 1, let's say, around the institution. And what this family tree is supposed to show you is that the Darwin family, wow, there's a lot of males who are really super bright. And eugenicists would show you this in a kind of a Faragian style. They should show you this as a fact of the world and say, this is a fact uh, that. Uh, male inheritance or male intelligence is inherited that there's patterns here and we can if if we figure out the rules of inheritance what we can do is accentuate the positive or eliminate the negative the key thing to get here if you just can't stand any of this stuff is simply it's about inheritance and pedigree and stock and breeds and qualities. How do we accentuate some qualities and eliminate other qualities? One strand of eugenics is just about families, family trees, and that. Now let me pause here. Speaking American, am I okay? Yep. Are we all with me on this? Yeah. Nobody's having a Trump moment of no, yeah. Too, yeah, no, okay. Okay, great, okay, so, so we're all right. And loud enough? See, I told you I belted too loud. Yes, yeah, there you go. Nobody sleeps, right? That's the key thing. So, and if you haven't already twigged on this, so as I said, Darwin's here, and uh, Francis Galton is here. Uh, Galton made this uh, diagram, so no surprise, he counts himself as super intelligent. And he always flag throws this one around uh, to remind you that he's Darwin's relative and bask in the glow of that family. Uh, family success. Um, another example of exactly this, again, since you're so good at this now, you can see males, females, one generation, the next, the next. And this shows um, the effects of inbreeding or the effects when cousins marry. And in this case, um, female and male of some qual they carry some quality. Parents didn't have it, brothers and sisters didn't have it, but they had it together. And they, when they had kids, all the kids had it. Now, without going into the fancy theory of genetics about why this would be the case, this, is a, this would be a piece of evidence to prove that the fact is that whatever this quality is has been inherited. And there's a genetic theory to this that would say, of course, we could have seen this coming that this would be the case. So this is recessive, if, that, if you know genetics, this is recessive. And so when recesses are together, big A, little a, it's all little a's. It's little a's for the whole family. And it just happens to be, in this case, F stands for feeble-mindedness. As a simple way to say it, very low IQ. And eugenicists, in addition to accentuating the positive, eliminate the negative. It's the same story, it's just a different quality. So a uh, eugenicist would be interested in identifying the inheritance pattern for whatever we want to put boundaries around and call a trait. Once we know the pattern or the rules that follow the inheritance of that trait, we can monitor its flow from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next. Eugenicists would tell stories like this. They'd say, um, here we're going to tell you a story about Ada Juke. And Ada Juke was a human being who lived um, in the middle part of the 18th century. And we know her descendants well. Problem is with Ada, she was a carrier. She was a carrier of a bad thing. And uh, she had a lot of kids. And those kids had a lot of kids. And those kids had a lot of kids. Generations grow and grow and grow. And as a consequence of all the kids and grandkids and great grandkids that she had, oh my God, what did she do? So, I mean, not oh my God, you guys, so welcome. The, uh, the broad idea is that Ada Jukes had a lot of kids, five, six, seven generations down the line. And if you add up what those kids and grandkids and great grandkids got up to, we should have seen this breed coming. This pedigree is a pedigree of misery. And if you can't read it in the back, 64 mentally diseased, 174 sex perverts, 196 illegitimate, 
142 paupers, and then the criminals and murders, uh, 177. I'm sure that's overlapping in some way. The broad point here is that it's a family tree of a kind. That's the important thing. And this is typical of the eugenics conversation, thinking about this one side of eugenics, which is about pedigree and breed and traits and qualities and patterns of inheritance related to single people. This was on a propaganda poster for eugenicists, and this is the propaganda poster which simply says, uh, shall we allow the Ada Jukes of today to continue this multiplication of misery? When will those who... This is, this, this is roughly the early part of the 20th century, and it's, it's American. So it's, and the bottom it says, when will those who pay for a pound of cure demand an ounce of prevention instead? So if you haven't figured this out, this is about sterilization. So the idea is if we could just cut, snip a bit of a line, cut a branch off the tree, we'd all be so much better off down the line. Now, forget the political conversation there. The, the whole point here is it's one branch of eugenics, which relies on an agricultural conversation of breed and breeding and pedigrees and family trees and things like that. And just like if you're breeding dogs and you get a runt, you just make sure that runt doesn't breed. Or if you're breeding a set of dogs and you get a super quality fine fur out of a dog, you breed that dog like crazy so that there's more and more and more. The agricultural metaphor is exactly what some eugenicists got up to uh, in the latter part of the 20th, uh, latter part of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century. It also explains this kind of thing which comes out of a woman's magazine, a magazine for, for housewives in the early part of the 20th century, shall I marry this man? Here's the bride and her father and her mother and her family tree. And here's the groom, the mother and the father and his family tree. You can see what's happening here. It's all about pedigree. And basically it says, before you marry this man, check out, check out his family tree. Don't ask for his bank account. Don't look at tax records. Look for crazy uncles and al alcoholic grandmothers because that's the kind of stuff when you marry a man, you marry a lineage, is the line of thinking. So uh, one line of eugenics is this direction that's all about agriculture and breed. And this contextualizes this image, which you had up at the very beginning, that some of you folks missed, but you'll live. Don't worry. You see it again. Well done, you. Seeds. It's all about seeds and stock and moving things along. Right. So I told you there's going to be two parts of eugenics. Then I'm going to ask you, I'm going to steer into the unknown waters and lay out some stuff, and then you're going to help me solve the problem. So this is one part of eugenics, the stock breed agriculture. The other one, this is, gets tougher. So rely on your tea or coffee if you have it sitting around. So this is going to get tougher because it's about mathematics. So hold on. So uh, this part relates uh, strongly to... Um, the UK, to Britain, to London, to Francis Galton, Carl Pearson, um, uh, uh, Ronald Fisher, and uh, the mathematical statisticians here at UCL. Um, Galton and Pearson were important proponents of the normal curve that in any population of, of, of uh, in any population, uh, qualities tend to distribute in a normal way, take height of human beings, for example, that if, that if we took everybody running around this uh, Bloomsbury right now, lined them up, we'd have a normal distribution. There'd be some very short people, some very tall people, a lot of us in the middle, and we would distribute in a certain way. Um, what, where this comes into eugenics is all about pushing the average one direction or another. So whereas one line of eugenics is about individuals and single bits of heredity, this stuff is about statistics. It's not about an individual. They don't tell individual stories. It's more about census data. It's more about populations of statistics in which individuals don't really count for much. But it's big data sets, like all of London, all of United Kingdom, all of Europe, all of the world. Um, this strand of eugenics is about statistics and census. A great example of that is, is this terrible graph here. And if you can't see it, it's about birth rates, and it's the number of children per capita of um, women who've uh, gone through university. 
and it's 0, 1, 2, 3, and up, and then it's over time, 1850, 1860, 1870, 1880, 1890. So it's historical data about women who've gone through university and, um, and uh, how many children have they had. And sometimes they include men too. So, so the broad message here is from 1850 to 1900, birth rates have gone down. And eugenicists talk about this stuff in the statistical direction here at UCL and elsewhere. They talk about this kind of census data a lot, like too much, so much that your eyes get numb with this kind of stuff. What they want to do is say, fact, birth rate is declining. What are we going to do about it? Not just anybody's birth rate, but somebody's birth rate. And we're going to come back to that later on in the talk. Another example of, of data that they would use, again, this histogram is the number of years between graduation and marriage for women coming out of university in, um, in uh, a part of America across the second half of the 19th century. And so what they did was they asked, how many years between graduating and getting married uh, occur in a woman's life? Is it 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way down to 36 years later? Well done. And this is a relative number of most women, most women, uh, fewer women, fewer women, fewer women. So what you get here is, again, it's statistics, it's census data, it's not about anybody in particular, it's about communities and populations. And what a eugenicist is going to do is look at this and say, how do we change this distribution to get the outcome that we want? So for example, if we want people to have more children earlier in their lives, what we might do is try to move this data in this direction. So women who come out of universities get married sooner, the assumption being that children are related to getting married and so on. And so if we wanted to slow that down, if we wanted to decrease a population over time, what we might do is increase the number of years between graduating from university and being married. So if you get nothing else out of this, get the fact that it's not about an individual, it's about groups, and it's all about shifting an average one direction or another. The kind of eugenics that was developed in here at UCL by people like Carl Pearson and Galton and Fisher and others, the broad idea is it's all statistical. They didn't meet people, human beings, they didn't care to, they, didn't, they just weren't even interested in us as human beings. That's going to be important later on. Another kind of census data comes out of this German, it just happens to be German, from the 1920s, and it's about birth rates. Birth rates in, I think we would say, classes, different class groups. And oh man, in anthropology, I don't even want to talk about classes, so just hold on to your hats with that. The basic idea here is that if you're a thuggish family, Thuggish family? Look at the picture. The uh, 4.9 children on average. If you're a criminal family, if you're part of a criminal marriage, you're 4.4, 4.9, 4.4, it's going to go down. If you're part of a sort of older family, let's just say working class for the purposes, 3.5, well, that's fewer children than the thug who's just breeding all over the place. Uh, the, the proper German family, 2.2. And the educated university elites, like us, right, <laughs> 1.9. So uh, stati this is a statistical or census-based kind of analysis of what's happening in a population, what demographically it's going on. And of course there are a lot of assumptions here thrown into what these categories are and what they mean, but a eugenicist in true Faragean style, I don't know why I'm on Farage today, but he... He's been in the news today, right? So why not? Uh, no, they it's caught him getting a lot of money from people that you know didn't leave their names. So the so the uh, the broad idea is that this would be held up and say, fact, we got to do something about it. Fact, don't dispute it. It's data, right? We we've been there before, right? We we understand that that game that's being played and move on. So so. Uh, a eugenicist would look at this and say, it's not about an individual, don't mean to hurt anybody, don't mean to exclude anybody, don't mean to push anybody around. The broad idea is, 
We just got to do better than this. These clearly we need more of, and these clearly we need fewer of, is the broad shift of where they want to go. Last one before we go to um, some policy. This graph shows basically a, another kind of concept, which is about birth rates, the good and the bad. If you just add up the birth rates of the folks, if you kind of take this kind of data and you put it into a bar graph and you say the top groups are the bad, so we just color them in black, and the bottom part are white, we're gonna, all right, bottom part are good, and we're gonna put them in white. You guys are already on fire about that idea. Um, if, you, if you project forward in time, based on the birth rates that are fact, this is trouble. Because if you let things happen without intervening, nature will take its course, and we are in big trouble because we all are part of the good group, and we are just going to get swamped out over time. So now, 30 years from now, 60, 90, 120 years from now, if we let these kind of birth rates continue, this is what's going to happen. They, bad, are going to start swamping us out. That's the language, swamping us out. Now, fact, birth rates, do the math, objective, ah! And that's, you didn't come in at a crazy time, really. It's OK. The, the big idea is that eugenics has two directions. One direction is to focus on pedigrees and individuals and single traits and the inheritance of those. But here at UCL, it's different. It's about census data, and it's about big data analysis, and it's about mathematical modeling, and it's about that statistical analysis of normal distributions and asking questions about how to move those averages one direction or another in order to accomplish different goals. It's highly theoretical. It's, it's maths department stuff, which is why it took place in the maths department here. So, so that, that's, the, that's the broad setting. So if, you've got, if you remember nothing else, this is what you need to remember of what I've just said over the last 20 minutes. Okay? So come back to us now. Influence of individuals like Ada Jukes, one person can lead to a huge thing down the road, positive or negative. Demographic changes, so that's all the statistics. Eugenicists start talking at the end of the 19th century about this kind of stuff about swamping, that's too many of them and not enough of us. And counter-selection is the thing I haven't said yet, but it's a Darwinian concept. So now sit up straight because we're going to talk about the man. The broad idea about, about counter-selection is, hang on a minute, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. The, the bad people are just prolific. There's just a lot of them. But they're not the right people. They're not the fittest. Uh, survival of the fittest means me. I'm the smart one, I'm the good one, I'm the virtuous one, I'm the one who can figure it out. I, we're the intelligentsia, right? How come we're losing? We gotta do something about this. And that, there's the counter selection. So it's not let nature take its course. Because we have done something wrong. We screwed it up. Maybe, don't wanna be Dickensian about it, maybe, or Malthusian about it, it's, it's, maybe it's social welfare. Maybe we're just too kind to the poor and they live too long. Maybe we love our luxury lifestyle with our double espresso latte with chocolate on top and we don't get out of bed before 10 and we don't work very hard and you know, I only learned one language this week and I'm just not trying very hard. So it's something about counter-selection brings out a Darwinian naturalism to the problem. And the naturalism is there's survival of the fittest, which we all agree in. And then there's what on earth is happening today. This isn't right. It's not natural. So how do we fix it? Now that's the geneticist heading off into the direction. Now, uh, policy solutions. You read anything on eugenics, they talk about two directions in doing something about it. Okay. You guys still with me? Still with me? Brilliant. Not sugar crash after those biscuits? No? OK. Good. OK, so different kinds of policy solutions. The literature talks about positive and negative. And I put them in a color because we're going to decode these later on. And that's where I'm going to need your help. So positive and negative eugenics. Quickly, what are those things? So negative eugenics are things like stop the bad stuff. So Ada Jukes, down the road, too many offspring, multiplication of misery. 
if we had just spent an ounce of prevention to sterilize her, we would have avoided a pound of cure having to deal with all that trouble. So as the 19th century turns into the 20th century, sterilization is something that becomes a common call in, um, in public policy circles, and that's eugenics. In some places it actually took effect, and in some places it was discussed widely but not implemented. So sterilization is a quick move. Segregation is another one, particularly for, um, if I just crassly say IQ, lower IQ um, uh, individuals who, um, again, to use the crazy language of the time, they don't know any better. So you can't help them. You can't teach them anything. They just don't know. Easily tempted away. Just segregate. Put them somewhere else. Madagascar was popular. Send them to Madagascar. They'll be on their own. We, they'll live humanely, but they won't add to the next generation. And then finally, well, that's deportation. So, so move people along or institutionalize people. Put them in asylums. Those are the, those are the ones that are almost always mentioned in discussions of, of negative eugenics. Much more commonly are cheaper, less dramatic solutions of things like marriage laws, this group can't breed with that group. Uh, this person can't marry that person. Immigration restriction. If we feel like we're being flooded, the best thing to do is stop the leak, stop the flood, turn off the valve, stop those immigrants from wherever they're coming from coming in. So a lot of eugenics conversations when it comes down to the level of implementation, negative eugenics, stopping bad things from happening. Uh, immigration restrictions really po uh, popular. It's a common policy response. Social sanction, get your grandmother to yell at you, to yell at your daughter, to yell at your son when they're starting to stray and get interested in somebody who isn't the right person. Love cannot conquer science is the argument of negative eugenics. Um, more moral training, so teach kids, particularly girls, particularly young girls, to keep on the path. And then birth control, commonly birth control not to your daughter but somebody else's daughter particularly groups of people that you don't like. Disperse birth control far and wide in those communities. You don't give birth control to your own daughter because that would increase her immorality. So you distribute birth control to other people because you want them to stop breeding. In the eugenics literature, birth control is a really complicated topic, but the broadest idea is give it to them, not us. So I just keep things simple on a Tuesday afternoon. Negative eugenics, lots of different kinds of policy proposals and solutions across the world in different contexts. So-called positive eugenics, accentuating the positive, so more of the good stuff. Lots of ideas. Most days I'm particularly in favor of the top one, which is subsidies and, and salary rises for university professors. I think that's a great idea. Whether it's eugenic or not, I don't care. Uh, <laughs> But the broad idea is that the cost of living, we all know this, the cost of living is tough. And if it just can make it easier, we, I, we would have more kids. Uh, I, I, child care, I'd have more kids if I could have somebody, like a nanny, take care of them. Uh, I don't know what the male version of a nanny is. What is that? A nanny, a, is it still a nanny? A manny. Oh, brilliant. Thank <laughs> you. That's brilliant. So nanny or mammy, manny, um, that would be brilliant. Um, and, and resorts and holidays, you've all seen Channel 5 documentaries on the love hotels that the Germans had. Um, and if not, you know, that would be on next week or something. But the, um, those extraordinary attention-getting things are, are far less common than other so-called positive eugenics activities like education and social pressure. Again, shall I marry this man or that man kind of stuff in women's magazines. Removing obstacles to early marriages. We'll get to that in a second. And then a critique of modernity, which I will definitely get to in a minute, and you'll know why when I get there. So again, a great example of positive eugenics. Remember, I'm going to ask you for help for something in just a minute, and it's going to relate to positive eugenics. So the positive eugenics, here's an example of an education thing. It's a county fair. It's a local fair, fate, where there's a eugenics booth set up, and the little kids are not listening, but the parents are, are listening to stories about how we should be making our reproductive choices in the, in the future. Just teach them. The smart kids will get it. The thick kids we're going to have to deal with later in another way. Roughly, that's the strategy here. 
and you, you know I'm not endorsing this, right? You guys got that, okay? So, okay, just for the tape, I'm not endorsing this. The broad idea. Uh, another thing is contests. Kids love contests. And here's a, what's called a fitter family contest, F-I-W-T-E-R. So the most fit family in a school. Um, kids would do their family trees. And the kids with the most brothers and sisters and, and cousins, um, if you, the desirable groups, you want them to breed a lot. So you encourage it with positive reinforcement. And so I, I think this kid has won the Fitter Family Contest in his school. And so he gets a trophy. And here they are. I cannot decipher who's who in this group. Um, uh, I, there's, who knows? There's a, I think it's brothers and sisters and their kids. I think that's what this is. Uh, but a fitter family contest, they were all over the place. And it's meant to be a positive eugenics because it's encouraging the good. That's the big idea there. Uh, critique of modernity, uh, positive eugenics, really is an aggressive critique of modernity. What does that have to do with this picture? Uh, positive eugenics, so-called, hated, hated women in the workplace. The, remember the graph of the distribution of women university graduates and marriage. The idea of positive eugenics, if you want to call it positive, is you decrease the amount of time between finishing university and getting married, in other words, having kids. So the eugenicist would hand out census data as fact that delayed marriages lead to a reduced number of offspring in a lifetime. Then down the road, if that keeps happening generation after generation, your birth rate is slowing down. Their birth rate is speeding up. Do the math. Fact. Okay? That's the political rhetoric of the policy making in eugenics. And so the critique of modernity is women should be at home and not at work. Women should not go to university. They should start having kids early on. The age of marriage for women should decrease over time, not increase. It's a critique of the, mo of the modernity of the end of the 19th and early 20th century. Um, and, and, and that's the, an important part of the political message. OK, now, I said I was going to tell you about the two parts of eugenics. Then I was going to take a turn into the thing I don't quite understand. I'm going to set up the question, and then you guys are going to help me solve it, right? Are we all still there? Yeah, we're still there, Joe. Hang on, right. As the sun fades, now it's going to get harder because it's going to get a bit more nebulous. Um, the Eugenics Commission here at UCL is asked to do something really specific, which is tell us about the history of eugenics at the intersection of race. Tell us about the history of eugenics at the intersection of race. And that's a scratchy head problem for me, because I don't quite know where it's going to go there, or where I should encourage it to go. This is a, a chapter title from Francis Galton, the, uh, who was the promoter of eugenics here at UCL, and paid for the university academics to do the work that they did in eugenics. The comparative worth of different races. It's the races word that's important here. Um, if you apply race thinking to negative eugenics, so that's a slide you've already seen. Think about race. And I want to ask questions like, OK, how does the lens of race help us interpret this? And frankly, this is going to be easy. This is the easy stuff. I'm going to give you the hard stuff. So the easy stuff is simple here. So you take something like um, the German National Socialists in the 1930s. They definitely separated. Germans and Jews into different races, and they adopted laws in order to stop interbreeding because they didn't want it. They thought the, that created polluted pedigrees and it dragged people down. Now again, I just cannot emphasize enough, I have no advocacy of this stuff. There's no, we have no business advocating anything like this. But as a historian looking back saying, Race, the lens of race helps us understand the negative bits pretty simply. And the example of the Germans and the, Jew, the Jewish peoples is a really great example from that lens. And so here's a rule book in the mid-1930s for German, uh, German civil servants to approve marriage licenses. 
and basically it's rules for how much Jewish, how much German is permitted. And not all of us speak German, so I'm helping you out here. These are forbidden. And the broad idea is like for like is fine, mixing is not. This is roughly the translation. And it's a bureaucrat's way to say that. So if your grandparents, I'll take, oops, sorry, if I take these away. So if your grandparents, your grandparents are all uh, uh, German, and your partner's grandparents are all German, it's permitted. If your, their grand, your grandparents are all German, and half of them are German, the other half uh, are Jewish, we're in trouble zone, forbidden, or you need special permission. That's how you read this kind of chart. And what you see here is, through the lens of race, well, we know for sure that Germans spoke in the language of race when it came to these sorts of things. And so what's happening here is they're trying to think through the racial consequences of eugenics. So the negative eugenics, fairly straightforward uh, analysis of, of using the lens of race. We can understand what negative eugenics is up to. That's easy. We're not going to waste your time on it. We're going to go to a harder thing, which is the positive eugenics. So now I'm going to start entering the zone where I need your help. So through the lens of race, asking questions like this, when I, start, when I read all this literature, I'm asking myself, how are eugenicists racists? How are eugenicists here at UCL racists? How is all that census taking racist? How is all the statistics racist? How is all the policy and mathematical modeling, how is that racist? That's where I want you to go and that's where I need you to help me because I think it's definitely there. We just need to tease it out and understand where it is. Let me give you an example of, of how I think this works. Here's an example of a winner of a fitter family contest. So I think, this is hard to interpret, uh, uh, I think father, mother, brother, and kids. And this is a winner of a fitter family contest in some part of America in the very beginning of the 19th century. And it just says, no race suicide in this family. No race suicide. OK, race, got it, right? So this is supposed to be positive eugenics. Encourage the bitter families to reproduce more. Positive reinforcement, positive eugenics. Where's the race? It feels like it's right there. You with me on that? I'm not so sure yet. I'm confused here now. Definitely it's white people. No surprise there. I think it's too simplistic to say this is about white. So let me press on a little bit more. Um, thinking about race categories. Now, I, oh man, what a dangerous place to talk. 18th century thinking about race, fairly global in its European thinking and it roughly separates out into what are called the great races of the world. And using different vocabularies and slightly different numbers, different people have different numbers and so on, but the rough translation is familiar to all of us and it's roughly continental in its language. Press on towards the end of the 19th century. Europeans start dividing themselves up a lot. And so by dividing Europeans up, you start getting Subdiv subdividing language here. So what you might see in an anthropologist's conversation about races of Europe, you might start seeing it's the Caucasian great race subdivided into these different categories. You guys still with me? Okay, so simple example, Madison Grant, 1910-ish, uh, just be beginning of the Great War, this map is supposed to tell us about the distribution of the three great races of Europe. So this is Caucasians subdividing themselves, or it's one Caucasian sub, 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 uh, subdividing everybody into the Mediterranean, self-explanatory, Alpine and Nordic, and then talking about overlaps and contact zones and all that stuff. So here's, this is racist because it's a racializing of human beings using categories based on, on who knows what, but it's using that categorizing system. I still don't think it gets us to race suicide um, uh, and press on a little bit more. You look at Francis Galton's work in the 1860s when he writes his famous uh, manifesto on, on 
eugenics and how to do it. And well, what's the problem and what's the solution? And it's all about census taking and it's all about moving averages up and down. But this is the kind of language that he uses for race. It's all over the place. It's extremely confusing. And a philosopher of science like me, I mean, if you came in late, you didn't, you didn't hear that Joe Kane is the best historian and philosopher here at UCL uh, for the last 25 years. That, that's me. And so, and so the, uh, the broad idea, it's good, isn't it? Yeah. And the broad idea is that when you look at Galton's work on race, it's a mess. It's all over the place. It's promiscuous in every way. And he talks about, for example, races of Europe as though nations are races, like the French. Yeah, we've all done that. Um, the races of Britain, he talks about the ancient, I think you read original, races of Britain. And again, familiar categories to us, pro, you know, it doesn't work if you know what, what we think today. Just get over that. But the broad idea is Anglo-Saxon, everybody's heard of that, um, and, and a whole mix of other things. <clears throat> and then he talks about the recent races of Britain, I suppose the, what we might call the four countries now, or the 12 countries, whatever it is these days, of Britain. And then he also talks about local races. He divides Londoners up into a bunch of categories, which is to an anthropologist, what are you doing? But he does do it. And in his conversation about comparing races, he talks about the races are in competition with each other in some biological way. And so it matters. And he doesn't just mean races that are on the continental scale. And we're heading towards where I need your help. So when he says the comparative worth of races, what he, the thing he's trying to compare is not the human beings from different continents. He's not even trying, in some, most of the time he's not even comparing the human beings in different countries. So, a lot of times he's comparing like Highlanders versus Lowlander Scots and asking, they're in competition against Yorkshiremen. <laughs> okay, that's odd, but all right. So when he talks about race suicide, here at UCL we're asked in the commission to talk about how does eugenics intersect with race. And the gut reaction is to say it's about the continental understanding of race, white, black, brown, etc. I think that's wrong. I think that's wrong, and that's where I need your help. So I think they talk more and more and more about what I just broadly call the Anglo-Saxons. Because I think they have in their mind here at UCL, in the census analysis, in the mathematical models, that where we should move everything is back to the original, which is an Anglo-Saxon world. An Anglo-Saxon world means Britain is white. Britain isn't just white. Britain is Anglo-Saxon. And the tribalism of that conversation, when Galton talks about the comparative worth of races, or when Pearson talks about we need a national eugenics, they're identifying a trajectory that is about building Britain to be some Anglo-Saxon ideal never existed, isn't going to exist, didn't exist in his moment. But the vision that he's got is something very specific. And when I call it an Anglo-Saxon nativism, that's what I mean to say he's trying to appropriate the language of anthropology and sociology and statistics and biology and evolutionary theory to head towards a racializing of human beings, but the target's not the, the, the continental scale. The target is something, something else. So I, I put on a map, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, about Anglo-Saxons, I just nicked this off the internet today. It's from last year. I don't even know if it's true, but it, but it sees Britain, the island, through the lens of a racist in the sense that it's a person who wants to see racial categories, populations and racial categories. And so I think, and this is where I need your help to tell me if you think I'm crazy or if you think there's some ground here, I think that if we talk about eugenics and the intersection of race, I think the proper lens has got to be this anthropological 
vision of a racialized Britain that subdivides into these kind of languages. And it, I don't think it has anything to do with the giant continental races. I think today the politics of race are, are massively different. But nevertheless, I think the conversation about eugenics in this period, this is what's getting them out of bed. This is what's forcing them to write and argue. And this is what's driving them mad as we go forward. Now, if you take that thesis, you can analyze something like this to say something that is truly racist in the worst way, which is to say this positive eugenics message is, I'm going to call, structurally racist. And it's structurally racist because what the eugenicists wanted to do using nice, flowery, pleasant language, nothing but positive, nothing but good, I think what they're doing is they're embedding a vision that is profoundly discriminatory. They want to deploy the assets of the state in order to make an Anglo-Saxon nation because their vision is that's the original and that's where we need to be. And they wrap it up in a science language, they wrap it up in a technological language, and they wrap it up in an anthropological language. But they essentially what they're trying to do is appropriate everyone's money to create a Britain that they think is the way it should be. And that's an absolutely fascinating direction. So the race suicide is Anglo-Saxons, you're even letting the Franks get in here, you need to stop that. You're letting the Italians come and take over and that's what's swamping us more than anything else. Stop Italy, Spain, and Greece, and boost Yorkshire will be fine, is the broad language. It also helps interpret this kind of language. Birth rate, this is, you've seen this graph before. It's birth rates across the 19th century, widely waved around. It doesn't matter that it's an American example. Widely waved around about dropping birth rates. It's birth rates of a particular group of people, and using the lens of race, you say, this is Anglo-Saxons complaining about Anglo-Saxons not reproducing themselves as fast as everyone else. That's the way I'm starting to interpret this conversation out of the statistics that's being done here. Or even this, the broad argument being criminality is a part of a pedigree, but this bit is about, in, well, it's, in this case, it's not Anglo-Saxons. It's, it's, uh, it's another racialized European group. But again, the people here would say, the, the eugenicists here would say, um, we need to let the good intelligentsia of the Anglo-Saxon world to promote themselves, and we need to slow everybody else down. Same kind of story, same kind of language. Uh, and then finally, to me, through the lens of Anglo-Saxon language, this helps us interpret this kind of image, which is, again, don't marry outside of your, if I say tribe, is that okay? Can we live with that? <laughs> don't marry outside of your, your they're going to say race. But really what they're going to say to us as people, and what we should hear is Anglo-Saxon community or something like that. So ultimately, this kind of advice, which is in a, women's magazine for a particular demographic of women in a particular moment of their life coming from a particular community it basically says stay in the group don't get out of it and that's the so-called positive eugenics message and I suppose the the broadest point I want to make is to say positive are you kidding me it's deeply damaging and it's deeply dangerous but just a little bit of whipped cream on top doesn't make it positive so that's the the broadest kind of take I want to say so, so bringing all this together into a, into a summary, I swear to God, I do not advocate this. I cannot say that enough for the purposes of the tape, right? So <laughs> the message of the eugenicists at the turn of the century here at UCL, people like Carl Pearson, who the Pearson Building's named after, people like Francis Galton, who wasn't at UCL, but he funded a lot of stuff and he hung out here a lot, and, and, and people like R.A. Fisher, who's important in the history of evolutionary biology, this is their vision of what they called national eugenics. It's deeply racist. It's positive is not the word for it. It's structurally racist. It's deploying the resources of the state 
to accomplish a particular goal, that is to pretend that the country is made up of one tribal group of people and nobody else belongs, nobody else should be here, everybody else should just go away, thank you very much, but don't leave before you leave your wallet on the table. Um, so, so that's national eugenics for me, and I'll be done in, in one minute. So, so the broad idea, again, taking it home, positive isn't positive. These things look very pleasant, I suppose, in all the literature. It's presented as an innocuous, soft way to move things forward. It's anything but soft, and I think the lens of race helps us see that much more clearly. Now, this really is where I need your help because I'm not sure that's a strong argument. I feel it is strong, but I don't think it's argued out well enough there. And, and we, we, we end with this kind of quote, which is coming from Francis Galton. And he says, basically, this is a message about positive eugenics, which is, look, you think the positive, it, it may seem monstrous that we're pushing out the weak, um, uh, the, that the weak should be crowded out by the strong in this case. But it's, it's more monstrous just to let that happen. It's, it's worse that the race is best fitted to play their part on the stage of life, the Anglo-Saxons, uh, should be crowded out by the incompetent, the ailing, and the desponding. So this is the political message of national eugenics, which is stuff that Pearson and others here at UCL developed. And this is the focus of what the eugenics inquiry is, is looking at. I think that this is the tricky word, and if we, think it's, if we interpret that as white, I think we're wrong. If we interpret it as Anglo-Saxon, I think we're heading down a better path for understanding what on earth is going on here, um, and, and we'll, we'll see that. And I'll just close by saying eugenics is an absolutely fascinating topic. I used to think I had, I had no interest in this. I've got other things to do, but eugenics, this is a famous image of eugenics, and it talks about from all, different, all these different disciplines, eugenic thinking arises. And if you can't see any of them, they're every discipline in science, from sociology to biography to law to eth ethnology, anthropology, archaeology, geology, history, etc. The broad idea is that the eugenicists wanted to deploy all the resources of the university to accomplish their policy objectives, which is make the world or will make their country an Anglo-Saxon country and push everybody else, me, out along the way. And I think that that's where we're heading in this commission. It's where I'd like to see the commission going. I need your help to think through this a little bit more clearly, and I think we've got some time for questions. So thank you for staying awake, and thank you for not running away. Let's get into this. Thank you very much. <laughs>